Caroline Reimer. Today I want to talk to you about Anglo-Saxon, Nordic and Germanic, heathenism and magic. Um, the name pagan and heathen, in case you didn't know, they both mean pretty much the same thing. Pagan is a Latin word and heathen was adopted from the Anglo-Saxon and they both mean country dweller or people who live as we would say these days in the sticks um, and the idea really was quite pejorative it was quite derogatory and um, it referred to the peasants basically um, the peasants would live in the countryside and they were much more the followers of the old ways if you can hear something that's my cat she is gonna play I will not be able to stop her she is going to wreck the place while I'm talking, so please excuse that. Oh no, it's big. Hello, big. Say hello. Right, ratch there. Ratching, that's a good old Anglo Saxon word. My cat is ratching. Okay, so uh, because the Anglo Saxons arrived in Romano Christian Britain, Around about, well, after the Romans left in the 5th century, sort of, so just pretty much straight on the heels of the Romans. And the Romans had just been converted to Christianity and the Roman world was still considered quite posh um, and the heathens were considered quite fierce and base. Um, and so there was the drive to still convert to the Christian religion and it was very much a socio-economic status thing um, and the heathens were followers of the old ways. Um, the Anglo-Saxons when they arrived very much pagan but were then pressured by the forces in the area to become refined and to become Christian. But there's some evidence that Christianity and heathenism was still practiced side by side for a very long time. In fact, there's an example of a, a priest who, in the Anglo-Saxon church, actually had two altars and one of them was for the Christian God and one of them was for the old pagan gods. Um, so they tolerated each other for some time and we can consider that in the sticks, in the countryside, the peasants were still following the old religions and that in the cities and in the civilised towns it was much more of a Christian flavour. So generally this is where we get the term heathens and pagans from. The Anglo-Saxons arrived slowly over 300 years. Now there's lots of romantic stories about Arthur fighting them off and great battles to be fought. But it would seem that this is perhaps just story because there fails to be a lot of archaeological evidence that says there were many battles being fought and actually they seem to be infiltrating and taking over. So they took over Romano-Celtic Britain and um, although DNA suggests that they were greater in number and you find Celtic DNA much more in Wales and Scotland and Cornwall. Um, in fact, they probably infiltrated, they probably settled alongside the Britons and eventually bred into the Anglo-Saxon as we know it. We don't really know much about their culture. We do have a few written records as, you know, the Anglo-Saxons actually brought with them a great deal of knowledge and learning, including writing, learning and universities, as well as the church, eventually. Um, so this is when we start to get more written records that come first hand, as opposed to the Romans writing about the Celts, but they were written down much later, they were written down around about the 10th century. Um, so what was passed on was passed on orally to us. And one of these was uh, what we call the Nine Herbs Charm. So we have these 
these charms that were written down and they were based on magic and medicine combined. Um, so if you don't know what the Nine Herbs charm is, um, here's a short extract. Um, this was taken off the internet, uh, you can go and find it. It was called Woden's Nine Herbs Charm and it's written in Anglo-Saxon and it's written in English. My apologies to anyone who may speak Anglo-Saxon, I am total novice. My accent is based on a mix of Cumbrian, Yorkshire and German dialect, um, which is where I'm coming from, which is probably quite accurate. Um, but I've probably not said all the words right. I've also shortened poem. So if you want to read the whole thing, go and find Woden's Nine Herb Charms on the internet. And read the whole thing, which I, I totally recommend. There's much more to it than I had time to um, try and create for you now. But here's a little taste of the Nine Herbs Charm. Gimain the Mugwoods, Wadla Melda Dest, Hotla Na Dest, Adlega Melde, Unadu Hatest, Oldest Water, Thumit with Leo, and with Lightig, Thumit with Adla, and with Omflege, Thumit with Dam Lathan, Digion Land Fera. On the wig brother, water murder. Eastern Opne, in and me tigo. Over the Kaita Kuren, over the Queen of Jordan, over the Piper Dedon. Over the fierce ned on. I love them with stunde and with stundest. So I with stundest. Atla and on fliege. And then Nathan, the young land fair. Stjonach yata the sort. Yon stjan giwaks. Stjanda with Atla. Janoth Yawaka Staithi Yawate Wistunath Yawatra Rekath Yawrathan Wopath Ut Ato With a Ridden Atra With a Ruten Atra With a Huiten Atra With a Hirunan Atra with thy girl one atra, with thy green an atra, with thy worn an atra, with thy weeden an atra, with thy brun an atra, with thy base one atra, with worm ge blade, with water ge blade, with thorn ge blade, with thistle ge blade. With a ski blade, with a toggy blade. Give a neck at a comb, eastern flogan. Of a neck northern comb, of a neck western, of a worthy order. Christ stood over at a angen condes. Ik eine wat, ihre nende. That thy neigen nedren, yan beheldeth. Motte eile wede no, where to misspringen, sees to slopen, eil sat water. Than ik this ata, of digi blower.
So the charm is a charm against poison and against infection. Um, and what it does is it not only uses herbal medicine, but it uses the magic of the number nine in reference to the god Woden. Now Woden is the Anglo-Saxon name for Odin. Um, and he, by allegory, by association with the number nine and by the reference to Woden, uh, infuses the charm with his magic. Not only does it mention Woden, but it also mentions Christ. And as it was written down in the 10th century, this is perhaps a later addition to an earlier charm that was remembered orally and passed along orally from generation to generation. Um, the reference to Christ and Woden perhaps implies that both gods were tolerated, although Christ may have been brought up to give it a more refined and acceptable flavour when it was written down around about the 10th century. Now, a lot of these texts were written down by monks because they were the ones who carried writing who had the ability to record for posterity what was previously recorded orally. So the monks may have added a Christian flavour onto what was originally a pagan and heathen um, magic. So Woden, of course, is the Anglo-Saxon name for Odin, who is known as the god of wisdom and healing. Um, he's known to have brought the runes from the world tree of Yggdrasil, where he hung for nine nights, inverted, wounded by his own spear. Now this has very much got a Christian flavour of Christ. He sacrificed himself to himself, but what he retrieves at the end of this ordeal is actually writing and rune magic, which he retrieved from the underworld, from the world of Yggdrasil. Um, he's also known for having one eye, and he wears a broad-brimmed hat and grows a long beard. It's very much typically a wizard character. And on his shoulders sit two ravens. And their names are Hugin and Munin, and their names translate as memory and thoughts. He's also accompanied by two wolves and their names are Gary and Flecky. And both of their names mean something like ravenous greed. Um, and so in many ways he could be seen as a shaman god, um, accompanied by animal totems. He of course rides his eight-legged horse Sleipnir through the underworld and through the skies and this is where we get the tales of the wild hunt from. Um, although we call him shamanic, that's my cat playing, although we call him shamanic he is in fact not in any way related to Siberian shamanism except that there is some association with these three worlds on the world tree um, and his madness and frenzy when he goes into trance to retrieve his his knowledge and the rune magic. Of course, actually, this is, is more Christian in Overtone. He's sacrificed on the tree for nine nights. Um, but the animals that he's associated with can be seen in many ways to be the lower world animals, the nature uh, spirits of wild force and pure animal drive. And of course the birds could be seen as much more mental higher world animals of thought and memory and consideration. And the ravens are said to whisper in his ear, hello. No, no, don't shake the camera. Mungo. This is Mungo's tail. 
You can't really see Mungo, he's, he's a slitherer. Mungo, are you going to bother me? It takes ages doing this. Oh, Mungo. Oh, Lord. So I'll just, just film this for Mungo here. So the ravens are said to whisper in his ear. So they've been out flying around the world. Come back and tell them all they've seen. What have you seen, mate? Um, which, of course, is what animals are useful for, aren't you? Got a use. Yeah? We're wild animals. So animals were very much revered in Anglo-Saxon and Germanic and Nordic cultures. And of course, cats, of course, were very much revered as sacred creatures. Um, and sacred to the goddess Freya. You want lots of us. So going back to Odin. Um, Odin, of course, his name comes from a Proto-Germanic word, Wodenaz, which is also perhaps where we get our, our name of wizard from, but um, we'll come back to that. Um, but Wodenaz means prophet or seer. Um, but there's some associations with madness and frenzy. Um, and it's because of this ecstatic state that... Um, Odin gets his reputation as being a shamanic figure and in many ways early European religion could be related to a shamanic, as we understand it now, um, animistic religion. Um, but it didn't bear much resemblance to Siberian or Mongolian shamanism. So we'll perhaps leave that analogy there. Um, I've got, I'm going to wrestle with the cat now. Okay, so, and Odin, Woden, of course, sacrificed one of his eyes for wisdom um, in a complete bout of madness. Uh, so it, there's some association with Merlin, who also ran wild in the forest to retrieve wisdom. It's almost as if wisdom cannot be retrieved through playing it tame. <laughs> There's no tame in this one. Oh yeah, you're not tame. No, oh, where's the tame? Look how that. Mungo. Mungo beanie. Okay. It's really disturbing this video, never mind. So in the poem of the Nine Herbs Charm, Odin is invoked for having slain a worm. And worm is Old English. Um, a worm is a serpent, but it is also a dragon. Um, the dragon and the worm and the serpent are all the same thing. Um, and Odin strikes this worm with nine glory sticks and the worm is said to have shattered into nine pieces and by this act the worm the poison is then forbidden to enter the home to enter the dwelling to enter the house which is also the body in many ways and so by this uh, magic sympathetic magic the herbs are charmed um, to help against contagion, fever and poisons. So in many ways, the nine glory twigs could be his association with runes, because runes, of course, are carved on twigs. Um, I've mentioned in my video on water magic that uh, the Norns lived at the bottom of the world tree by the well of Udebruna at the roots of Yggdrasil and they were said to carve symbols upon sticks. Now I presume that the symbols that they carved were in fact runes and what the Norns did was they 
They wove and they spun and they carved symbols upon sticks and they birthed each person's fate out of the well of Uda Bruna. And they were like the fairy godmothers at the birth of each uh, person, the norns were always present. So with this association with fate, the runes brought back much power and magic with them. And in today's world, we don't really see writing as magic, but there's definitely been magical associations with runes, which were probably the earliest European writing and um, were found across Europe, even in Portugal. Um, so it was perhaps much older than uh, the later Latin alphabet that we inherited. But even in the Latin alphabet, of course, there was association with letters bringing magical properties with them. But of course, today we, we bang out on a typewriter and we have no concern. The word that we have today for witch, of course, uh, is of Anglo-Saxon origin. And um, in Norse it was Vitki. Um, and the Norse witch was the Sodia practitioner. And she was associated with spinning and was shown often with the distaff and the spindle and spinning thread from flax into, into yarn. Now, Sadir practitioners were also renowned for knot magic and would sell knots to sailors um, to unleash favourable winds, very often nine knots. So the number nine was very sacred um, and by use of it, it was a very magical force. The distaff or the wand was the feminine symbol of magic um, and there are many graves where um, prophetesses and said practitioners were buried with their distaff or with a wand. Um, I'm going to put you down there. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> but many of the women's tasks were seen as magical. Things like sweeping the floor, cooking, um, being the nursemaid, being the healer. And this either indicates that after Christianity, women were very much condemned and feared um, and considered a threat to Christian power, or that in Anglo-Saxon world, um, the world of the magic world and the everyday world were very much conjoined and very much side by side, and any everyday task could be made a magical task. So in many ways there was a thin line between the normal world and the magical world. The Norns, of course, were known as weaver goddesses and they were a very strange collective. They were said to be born of the gods, the giants and the dwarves. Um, so there were many Norns, but the most famous of all were the three Norns, Erda, Vodandi and Skuld, who sat at the foot of the world tree, which as I've mentioned in the water magic, Erda means that which has been Vedanti Mitch means that which is happening now, and Skuld means that which should come around. And these were the goddesses of fate, and they were present at the birth of every child, and they would spin out of the well of Udebruna, the fate, the Orlogpater of that child, which is like the golden thread of that person's fate. In the Norse and Germanic thought, you could not escape your fate. Your fate was assigned to you at birth and no matter what you did, you could not escape. That was going to be your fate for life. So this is very much at odds with our worldview that everything is possible. If you can dream it, you can do it. Try, try, try again. If you try hard enough, you can get there. This is um, very different to the Germanic worldview of what will happen will happen, what will be will be. Um, and so in, in some ways the only thing you could really do is to meet your fate with positivity and in, in some ways perhaps with our world view of we have to try to succeed and if we don't do it we weren't trying hard enough leaves many of us feeling 
a failure leaves many of us feeling that we uh, have somehow, you know, failed in life and not met the challenges of life. This perhaps is quite depressing for us and maybe the Germanic world view is that what will be will be and there's nothing you can do about it. Now we have passed down to us um, a lot of our European traditions still in fairy tales. And we all know the tale of Sleeping Beauty. How Sleeping Beauty was born and all the goddesses and fairy godmothers gathered around her and gave her lovely sacred gifts for life except for the one evil and wicked fairy who had not been invited and came and was angry and cursed Sleeping Beauty and said that at the age of 16 she would prick her finger on a spinning needle and she would fall asleep for a hundred years. Now this is a strange and terrible fate that she should prick her finger upon a needle. Um, but of course there's the one last fairy who has not yet spoken and she mitigates the destiny of Sleeping Beauty. She cannot change the destiny of Sleeping Beauty, that's how it will be, but what she can do is turn it to a good end. And how does she do this? She says that even though Sleeping Beauty will be asleep at the age of adulthood, she will be woken by the kiss of true love. In many ways, you can see this allegory as coming into adulthood and losing the gift of the Fae, losing the magical gifts that the Fae have given us. And yet, there is the potential to awaken that, to awaken to our full divine being and power, and that the awakener is in fact true love. The awakener is in fact love that is beyond the human contractual misunderstood confused love but the real emotional real deal you know and so this is the way i like to see the sleeping beauty story that although we are fated to be in the mortal flesh we can still awaken to our true selves through emotion and through the power of the heart of course, there's another unfortunate tale, which is the tale of Baldir. And Frigga, who is Baldir's mother, finds out that Baldir will die a horrific death. And trying to avert his fate, she goes throughout the kingdom and extracts a promise from every living thing that they will not harm her son. Of course, the one thing she ignores that she finds too insignificant is the one thing that kills him and that is the mistletoe and she thinks the mistletoe is so harmless and so insignificant that she doesn't need to get a promise from him and of course the god Loki through his trickery finds the mistletoe creates it into a spear and that is how the god Baldir is killed now the allegory of this tale is that even the gods cannot escape their fate and so they have to meet fate head on stoically there's a lot of reference to even at the end of the world the gods cannot escape their fate it's an inevitable conclusion that all shall meet the end of the line really um the best thing we can do is be warriors in life and be warriors in the face of our own fates. Okay, so I'll come back to the runes, those lots of fate that were carved at the bottom of the world tree, under the well of Udebruna, under the roots of Yggdrasil. The word rune means secret or whisper, and this explains a lot about how we are supposed to use the runes that were retrieved, let's not forget, by the god Odin, by sacrificing himself to himself to retrieve this amazing wisdom of writing and knowledge. So we don't just write the runes, but the runes are sound. 
and they are to be chanted over, they are to be whispered. Um, and the sound itself is said to be magical. The sound Reido or the sound Gifu um, are magical sounds. Um, so when you create runes, you're not only supposed to draw them, but you're supposed to whisper them into life. And this is done by a Galdia. And a Galdia is a charm or an intonation of sound that brings about a rhythmic hallucinatory effect. Um, charms are what we have recorded. And the magic of poetry and the magic of rhyme was considered the art of creating change. The way that the Anglo-Saxons, Norse and Scandinavians rhymed seemed to be based on a process of alliteration. So all vowel sounds were considered to rhyme. So it didn't matter if you were saying O, oh, U or E, there was a rhyme in there. And also alliteration of consonants was very, very significant. So, it was not rhyme exactly as we understand rhyme, you know, rhyming couplets and things like this. Um, it was a loose rhyme, it was based on repetition of those sounds. And the runes were awakened and given life force by the very breath itself. And the art of breathing birthed the breath and life of the runes. So they were infused with the magical breath. The nine herb charms, uh, the nine herb charm, the herbs are charmed over, the patient is charmed over, and finally the poison is blown out. Each of these is the passing of whispered charms, and the passing of the breath, which was infused with magic. So in Anglo-Saxon and German, let's call it Germanic magic, it was the breath itself that was infused with power. So many of the Anglo-Saxon charms that we have recorded are actually against elves, um, and attack from elves and what we call elf shots. And these were supernatural poisoned arrows that were sent to humans, which would cause sickness and strife. Now, it could be that this is a later Christian slant upon things that we don't have recorded from earlier times. There was obviously a lot of respect for elves. And many of the names were being blessed by the elves, like Elf Gifu, which means elf gift. Um, and the elves were akin to gods, but they were very much respected and not, not messed around with, or they could cause blight. Um, and perhaps this idea of elf shot was a later Christian slant, which then turned the, the heathens, the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings against their own gods and against their own tradition and portrayed that as being the devil's work and demonic and not in the light of Christ. Um, so nowadays we would call the psychic poison arrows psychic attack um, and very much also shamans still work with that today. Um, the attack from other shamans, the invisible attack that brings about, you know, lack of ease and illness in people. But the elves were supposed to be responsible for all sorts of deformities, all sorts of blights. Um, and, and so they started drawing these protective symbols. Um, you can see many of them uh, were witch marks 
and they were later symbols drawn in the early medieval times to avert witches and the evil of magical practitioners. But originally they were marks that were drawn on churches and on doors and on windows and they would avert the evil of elves. Um, and one of these actually many pagans wear today and it's the pentagram. And actually it was drawn originally in Anglo-Saxon churches to avert the evil of dark elves and was called the Elven Star. Um, today it's still seen as a protective symbol but along a different light. It's very odd that this is what uh, many people are wearing and don't really know it. So I've done a video on working with uh, the fairies and nature spirits and in there I've mentioned the light elves and the dark elves and how they were somewhat different. Um, and we get this classification from Snorley Sturluson in the 13th century and at that time that he was writing he was now living in a Christian world. So there was the association of the light elves being angelic and the dark elves being slightly more demonic um, but really it, it was a an upper world and a lower world classification the dark elves were the elves of the deep and of rocks and of the ground and the light elves were the elves of the ethers and the heavens um, as we understood that in those days but either way, the elves were to be very much treated with respect, not disturbed and not angered. And Freya herself was said to have slept with the dwarves, with the dark elves, to gain her necklace, the necklace of Brisingamen. Um, and she travelled in a chariot that was drawn by cats. And cats, in many traditions, have been very sacred animals. They were definitely sacred to the Germanic tribes, and they were sacred to Freya. And this association with a god to an animal was very common too. And a god to an animal totem, um, such as Odin and his ravens, and Freya and her cats. And there was a lot of respect for the power of animals. So in Germanic thought, not only were the gods divine, but their animals were divine too, and animals in general were divine too. And we can see this in the Viking berserkers and the Ulfheldnir, and they were the bear coats and the wolf coats, and they would take on the totem power of their animal spirits and fly into frenzy on the battlegrounds and of course they consumed hallucinogenic plants they were you know out of this world in a different zone and were almost undefeatable um, immune to pain and speedy and fierce so the Germanic heathens respected animals and it was thought that a part of the soul incarnated in animal form and this was the Fulgia and it could incarnate as an animal or sometimes it was seen as a spirit spouse as a beautiful woman um, but it was brought into the world at the time of a human's birth and it left the world with them and throughout their lives the animal and the human were tied together. And of course this is where we get our um, witch and animal familiar concept from. Who is the spirit animal who would retrieve information and be part of the witch? And if you harmed the animal you harmed the witch. And if you harmed the witch you harmed the animal. Um, and it was based on the Philgia. And the Philgia um, was a part of the soul and the Hemingja was another part of the soul. And the Hemingja was the likeness of the human 
but in spirit form. And so the Hominja could be seen coming ahead of the person to announce that person's arrival. Um, the Filgia could be seen in dreams, bringing a person information, giving them predictions about the future. And it's very much like we would call a doppelganger these days, or um, sometimes I, I've had a dream with an animal in it, um, and, and this was seen as the Filgia in our Norse and Germanic thought. And the Filgia could be uh, passed along. Uh, there was sort of a greater Filgia that belonged to a tribe of people, belonged to a family of people, and this could sort of be inherited. And what we understand of this today is um, the tribe's totem. So um, very much still similar in today in that the tribe of Britain has the totem of a lion and a unicorn. The tribe of America has a totem of an eagle. Um, and the tribe in Germany in Berlin, there's the, the bear. Um, and many tribes have different animal spirits. And this was like an oversoul of the clan, the country, the tribe. And also the Hominja could be inherited through the name, through giving your grandchildren the name of an ancestor. So skipping generations, obviously you don't want two Johns in the same family, um, or, although you can, um, but it could be inherited through the name and this was also inheriting the look of a person. And today I suppose we would call that inheriting family karma. And it's very much the sense of the, the uh, non Uder who is that which has been, that which we are born into, that we have inherited, that we cannot change in any way. And that's because it happened before we arrived and we have inherited it. Um, so these are the different aspects of the soul. And of course, after we died, we could return to nature as elves. And the elves could in fact be our ancestors and our family and they were set to hang out by burial mounds, which the Anglo-Saxons took over um, from the Iron Age Celts and continued to bury their dead in these burial mounds. So they obviously already considered them sacred places and sacred landscape. So many people today consider that they can choose their power animals, um, and this is a modern concept of shamanism and um, it wasn't really like that in the old heathen thought. The animal chose you and the name Fulgia actually links to the concept of afterbirth and the concept was that when the baby was born the afterbirth would be placed out in nature and whichever animal came along and ate the afterbirth was the totem animal, the Fulgia the animal spirit that had chosen that child and come into the world with that child and incarnated with that child. So there were many aspects of soul and spirit in Anglo-Saxon heathenism, Germanic heathenism, Norse heathenism. It's such a mouthful to say that, so we're just a Germanic thought. Um, and the universe itself had many parts, of course. There were the nine worlds which all met on the trunk of the world tree Yggdrasil. There was the world of fire and ice, there was the world of the gods and the dwarves, there was the world of the Norns, there was Helheim, there was many, many different worlds. And of course, the only world that we inhabited was Midgard. Um, but we could travel to the others and we were connected to these spirit parts. Um, and also there were many gods, there were the Vanir and the Aesir and the Dwarves and the Giants. And so it was a very rich cosmology. And later it, it turned into a Christian faith. And as I say, they lived side by side for a little while. And of course, we still recorded our European heritage way into the 17th century. Ingram's fairy tales and in European fairy tales. 
which says to me that that was a very long tradition that was still alive even in those days. So it never really died out. Um, I don't think Europe ever fully became Christianized and in the backwaters, in the pagans, in the heathens, in the countryside dwellers, they were still living with the old ways and with magic. With the coming of Christianity, this rich heritage was condensed down to this duality, this vision of the body and the soul, um, heaven and hell, and in many ways it was such a loss of such a rich tradition because there were so many worlds and all the worlds met on the world tree and so many of us are turning now again to this world tree that we understand which as I say in many ways is not a million miles from the idea of Christ on the cross and Odin on the tree of Yggdrasil. So it's a very ancient religion that has many different flavours and evolved to become something else. But what happened to make it evolve was the Anglo-Saxon church was overtaken by the Norman church and the Anglo-Saxons lost to the Normans in 1066. And so in many ways uh, we're returning to our European heritage and we're returning to the idea of there being many gods and many faiths and many worlds and really I don't think we ever really lost that. So thank you for listening to that. I, I know there's a lot more I could say. There's a lot of gods I haven't mentioned and um, there's a lot of religion that I, I haven't gone into but it was simply a flavour of um, how Europe was and how our tradition was in the very early days before we became Christianized and lost those spoken um, recordings of knowledge that got passed down through the families and through generations. So I just want to lay that little coast to rest and um, um, if you've got anything else to add to that please write it in the comments below so long as it's respectful hey. And I thank you for listening and I hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks. Bye.